Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Scott Bernstein, along with my co-host, Jimmy Bucciolato, the doctor. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to give you a, a quick 15-minute supplemental episode right now, uh, talking Outlaws Motorcycle Club news. There's a lot of stuff to report, a lot of stuff that's going on in real time. I'm going to start with something that could just be the bombshell of all bombshells when it comes to biker news. Uh, there are rumblings, and I've heard this from multiple people, that there have been talks convened between the highest levels of the outlaws and the highest levels of the hell's angels to discuss some type of ceasefire or truce um, from their 50 year long war uh, to, you know, kind of like your enemy's enemy is your friend. There seems to be a lot of consternation about what the pagans and Mongols are doing. We've been talking about it quite a bit on, on OG pod. Um, and from what I've been telling, what I've been told starting in December, some of these talks have, have started, uh, to take place and they're at the highest levels of, of both of these clubs. And, uh, it's just incredibly compelling news when you know the history of, of these two groups. This isn't, uh, unusual, right? For not, I mean, it is in a way that these two are legendary rivals, but wasn't there some kind of summit in the. Yes, in the it, '90s with George Christie and Taco Bowman. Yeah, yeah right. To, well, this is the second time territory and things like that. This is the know? second time that. Well, if this is true, this is the second time that you know peace conferences have taken place between the Outlaws and the Hell's Angels. Their war dates back to 1974, where there was a a, a triple murder uh, in, in South Florida, where the Outlaws killed three Hell's Angels from the East Coast that uh, there had been a dispute, uh, New Year's of 73, and then I think it was spring of 74, they, they lured the three guys they had an issue with uh, down to Florida and killed them. And since then, there's been a, a brutal 50-year power struggle. And uh, it's just, I, that really came out of the blue. When I heard that, it, it took me off guard because in Michigan, where we are right now, at least up until December, there were tensions that were building, and this is based on DEA and FBI reports and court files that were building with the Hells Angels coming into Michigan for the first time ever uh, in 2019. And uh, there was a guy who got arrested uh, last year and said, got caught on a wire talking about how he was supplying weapons to the outlaws and Hells Angels for a pending war in Michigan. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... I feel like that that was bullshit. A little, hyper, a little hyperbolic. <laughs> yeah, I th because I think um, I think um, wasn't he? Um, I can't remember. His name, he was a guy that was living, uh, I believe, on the west side of the state. Got caught selling guns. He didn't say this to any law enforcement in like a debriefing. Right. He was caught on a wire talking to a guy in his, you know group or his crew yeah that was wired and wasn't it, there's there's an argument i think that he was embellishing that he was yeah it might have been getting status to, right trying to uh make it seem like he was a bigger deal than he was by by dropping these these major club names when it, it that may not have been the right. case um but i what we do know though is that there is at least one if not two or three hell's angels chapters that have popped up in michigan in the last three or four years they had never dared come into the state before because this has always been outlaws territory and uh they they've i think intentionally stayed away from detroit which is the outlaws you know one of their international hubs they're either on the west side or they're up north so just something to keep an eye out on and i think it in some ways there was an inevitable um backlash to what was going on with the pagans and the mongols i mean I, I don't know if i would have predicted that the hell's angels and the outlaws would sit down at the table together and talk about some form of joining forces but i knew that other biker bosses around the country weren't just going to sit by and allow the, the the pagans and the mongols just to start chewing up territory all across the country is it uh the highwaymen and the outlaws coexist in detroit pretty well uh, as far as i know but they're they hate each other though okay but they do i guess they do they, coexist. yeah they coexist right not not to say that they love each other but that they they do coexist so um hopefully and uh, i heard there were some you know, overtures from the hell's angels at least in 2022 to the highwaymen about possibly 
some type of an alliance. Yeah, I was going to say, what, what's the high, highwayman's posture? They've been the rivals Hells with the Hells Angels, too. They had some famous biker wars in the 70s with uh, Hells Angels affiliates okay. that were in this area. I see. Um, but again, keep, keep an eye on uh, Keep an eye out for this. I'll be reporting it on Gink's Report. We'll be talking about it here in the OG pod. And then I want to finish off with uh, the discussion of the life and legacy of one of the most historically significant outlaws, motorcycle club shot callers. Uh, he comes from our hometown of Detroit, Lenny Braun. They called him Lenny the Blonde. Uh, he passed away this week, 78 years old, and he was Taco Bowman's mentor. He was Taco Bowman's uh, predecessor. He led the outlaws at the time that the outlaws were becoming what we know the outlaws are today. I believe he led, the, led them for about a dozen years from the early 70s into the early 80s when Taco Bowman took over and he had to go to prison for a little bit. But uh, it was known as an innovator, a diplomat, someone that was beloved. Um, he was national president. He was l the Detroit Outlaws president. Um, but Taco became national president. I see, right. But uh, he was someone that led the the Outlaws in Detroit throughout the entire seventies and early eighties, and he was integral in expanding the Outlaws into Canada. Uh, he led a takeover of Ontario, where the Outlaws first made an alliance with. At that point, Canada's biggest biker gang, the Satan's Choice. Um, and that alliance then turned into an absorption where uh, there was a famous patch over that took place July 1st, 1977 at, uh, on Crystal Beach, which is right off Lake Erie. It's uh, about a 10 minute drive from the Detroit, uh, the Michigan Canadian border. And uh, Lenny Braun and all of the Satan's Choice major bosses from Ontario were there. Uh, and they had a, a, a huge ceremony and celebration where all of the Satan's Choice shot callers took off their Satan Choice gear and threw it into a giant bonfire. Mm. And Lenny Braun and all of the American outlaw luminaries gave them official outlaw gear and made them the official you know, branch of the outlaws in Ontario. And this mother McEwen, who was the engineering of this alliance on the Canadian side, got named, you know, the boss of all of Canada for the Outlaws. This all happened on this famous weekend in July of 77. And Satan's Choice, though, there were still other chapters in Canada. Yes. Right? They, they, just took, they just took out Satan Choice's Ontario okay. uh, presence. Right. Uh, so Lenny Braun was this, uh, you know, Taco was more of a, I was telling, talking to Jimmy off air, it was more of like a, a wartime general. And from what I've talked to people that knew Lenny Braun, he, he was a, he was a dreamer. He was an innovator. He was a diplomat, someone that uh, I think he was very tough, not to say that he was, a, uh, was weak, but, you know, someone that wanted to um, make as many connections, network as much as possible and, and win people over by talking as opposed to coming in and you know, shooting people or stabbing people. He had long blonde hair, uh, curly blonde hair. That's why I called him Lenny the Blonde. Uh, I know that he was someone that in his later years of life got into uh, glass art and uh, was someone that was, I think he would go to churches and help them uh, construct stained glass windows. That's cool. Yeah. But he was a legend's legend when it comes well, to the history of, of the outlaws. Those OGs came out of like the counterculture. Yeah. So they, they right. Rock and roll, yeah. art, creative. I mean, that, that kind of makes sense. And, you know? and Lenny was, from what everyone I've talked to, he was a, kind of a good time party boss. Um, and he famously wanted to create a Detroit outlaw headquarters at the old Garwood mansion, which was the epicenter of the counterculture yeah. in Detroit in the late sixties, early seventies. It's on an Island called Gray Haven Island, right, uh, in on kind of the East part of downtown Detroit off the river. And uh, he called all, he called for a national run of outlaws in 1972. All of the major outlaws came to Detroit to kind of christen what was going to be the new headquarters. And it got, it got out of hand and they trashed the place and it made the front page of the newspaper. Yeah, I was looking at the Detroit Free Press. Yeah, but, but it shows you what an innovator, what a dreamer, you know, in a positive way that Lenny was, that he, he saw this famous mansion that was the picture of counterculture and, and turn it into this, you know, alternative picture of counterculture in the area with, with the bikers. 
Yeah, the the, uh, the mansion didn't like the Stooges party there. Yeah, everybody, everybody like, party yeah, there. That's uh, right, Alice Cooper maybe from sixty eight to seventy two. I think it was known as the place to go after you know the night was done and you'd gone and seen all the shows that you could see uh, between you know let's say ten o'clock at night and two o'clock in the morning. But then you showed up at the mansion at three, and from three to six, that's when the real party started. And 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 all these iconic rock and rollers would get up and jam with each other. Yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I thought. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I've heard about that. Before. I just learned about it recently. That, that's 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 pretty cool. Well, obviously the the infamous Stones concert. We we talked to George Christie about this. That that things didn't go well between the bikers and the rock and roll guys. But there are other examples where there there there's like I think a, in Detroit they've pretty, always they, gotten along. <laughs> they like to party together. I mean, even to the in more recent times, and I think I've said this on here. Kid Rock, uh, whenever he's on concert, the Outlaws do all of his uh, security. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, as we finished up talking about Lenny Braun, I think it's important to, to talk about the fact that he he was a you know, major factor in expanding the outlaws outside of America, you know, bringing them into Canada. Taco then brought them to Europe. Um, and Taco's obviously the way more notorious, iconic boss. Sure. But but I think Taco learned a lot from Lenny and Lenny, in addition to having this idea of turning this mansion into the headquarters and in addition to staging this uh, absorption of Satan's choice in, in Ontario, he created in 1975, what would be dubbed a underground fugitive railroad for any bikers in the United States that were running from the man and needed to take refuge across the border Lenny for a price. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I mean, I think if it was outlaws, he would do it, yeah, to, yeah. you know, because it was an outlaw. But anybody right. could also use this service. They would have to pay. And he, through his contacts with the Satan's, Satan's Choice in Ontario, would smuggle these guys in cargo ships <laughs> and get them set up in jobs uh, in different parts of Ontario. And a lot of these guys lived for years well, it was before a lot they easier. got caught. Back then, like, yeah. you don't have Homeland Security and shit yeah. like that. Because, well, I mean, the, the Italians, there's a lot of that going on, too. And Lenny was was tied into uh, the Detroit uh, Italians. I think he was the one who introduced Taco to a lot of those guys. Um, I know we worked with the Jackaloni crew. I talked to some of the old Jackaloni crew guys in the last couple of days, and they gave me some some fond memories of Lenny. So, you know, RIP to Lenny Braun was not known as, a, like I said, he wasn't a, a guy that had bodies. Uh, he was he had a minor criminal record. He took a drug pinch in 81, a federal uh, narcotics trafficking with with outlaws down in um, Florida. But, uh, you know, was just, you know, kind of the quintessential, you know, good time biker guy that you know probably isn't too dangerous but at the same time is someone that represents that crazy culture sure. you know it, it kind of fits in yeah. there like the dude you know he, he fits in there for his time and place he fits in there just like a glove and that's who i think lenny braun was and uh so r.i.p to lenny braun i know the detroit outlaws uh did a big uh shindig for his funeral and his his wake he was living in royal oak which i'm i'm in royal oak a lot if i knew lenny was in royal oak i would have uh took him off to a, to a cup of coffee <laughs> but uh that that's our our quick uh supplemental episode we love giving you biker stuff we know we're getting a lot of great feedback for for people that really enjoy the biker stuff so we're gonna try to keep on giving it to you give you more of it maybe some more of these supplemental um episodes for Scott Bernstein, for Benny Behind the Glass, and Jimmy Bucciolato, we are out. We'll see you next week.